Breaking news, notorious drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman has been sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years for multiple charges in a drug trafficking case. Right now, federal prosecutors are holding a press conference in Brooklyn outside of the courthouse to discuss the details, and right now his lawyers are speaking. Let's go ahead and listen in. And how it ended is exactly perfect for that description, in that it didn't make a difference what the jury saw, what they said, what they discussed, what they voted on. At the end of the day, all that mattered was the government's evidence, no matter how flawed it may have been, no matter how many lunatics and sociopaths and psychopaths that it depended on. All that mattered was the evidence and the jury be damned. We learned that up to five jurors broke the law, violated the law while they were judging Mr. Guzman for crimes. And nevertheless, we couldn't even get a hearing to determine what actually happened. Because as we all know, had we had that hearing, had we had that hearing, chaos uh, would have ensued and we would have been back here for round two. And that was something that the United States government could never have. They fought desperately against it. And that's why the judge ended this with a, a very uh, quickly written and canned 43-page opinion, which will now be part of the appeal and probably the most significant appeal issue. So um, all we had asked for at the beginning was a fair trial. I'm not here to tell you that Joaquin Guzman is a saint. I'm not here to tell you that what occurred, um, that, that the witnesses were unusual than any other American trial. All we asked for was fairness. And no matter what you think of Joaquin Guzman, he still deserves a fair trial. Everybody does in America. Because if you don't give a fair trial to Joaquin Guzman, what happens to the guy off the street that gets arrested for tax evasion? Well, they got away with it in a case like Guzman. They can get away with it in a case like that as well. With regard to Andrea uh, Fernandez Velez, it was a wonderful uh, audition to, to watch her. I, I have uh, empathy for her. Um, but what was left unsaid was the fact that for her drug dealing, which included many things that had nothing to do with Joaquin Guzman and many things that she tried to do behind his back, which came from government witnesses. I'm not making this up. She didn't spend a single day in prison. So I think that was a pretty good uh, thing to end up with, to be involved in drug dealing for all those years. Um, she had romantic relationships with multiple uh, narco traffickers. Um, she certainly did her part. She talked about a concern about being killed. Well, she certainly did her part uh, to get other people put in the soup as well, having nothing to do with Joaquin Guzman. But today, is, I'm not here to bury uh, Andrea Velez Fernandez, just to point out that this is one of the sweetheart deals that the government witnesses got. For all of her drug dealing, for all of her crimes, she did not spend a single day in prison. And she's not the only one, because other people testified in this case that never spent a day in prison that weren't even charged with the crime. The killers that you heard that testified, short sentences, some of them are out already. Some of them have uh, been out for years. Others are getting out soon, and they're all going to be here. They're all going to be here. We're not getting the best uh, from Mexico. We're not getting the best from Colombia. We're not getting their best. They're here. They're going to get citizenship, and they're going to be walking amongst you. Remember that all to get Joaquin Guzman. Could they have gotten Joaquin Guzman without every single one of them that they made these deals with? Of course they could have, but it might have taken more of an effort and it might have put a conviction more at risk. So with that, I appreciate all of you coming. You guys worked very hard. I apologize to all of you that have been here since last night, but it's not my fault. But if you have any questions. Well, I think, uh, you know, Joaquin wanted to finally have his peace. Um, he wanted to say it. He wanted to get out what was on his chest. Um, this is a guy that had an exemplary behavior in the most crushing of circumstances and conditions. We heard about a, a, some um, financial defendant who uh, tried to choke a prosecutor during his trial a couple of months ago. Joaquin Guzman behaved like a gentleman. He respects the American justice system. That's why I'm bringing this up. But all he wanted, and he said to me from day one, is I just want a fair trial. You tell me that I can get justice here, I just want a fair trial. And at the end of the day, 
We like to pretend that it was justice. It was not justice. You can't have a situation where uh, jurors are running around lying, lying to a judge, lying to a judge about what they were doing and, and learning about allegations that were purposely kept out by the government. So uh, he's frustrated with that, but you know, look, he's uh, got tremendous equanimity and he's uh, handled this well. Um, I know that everybody's thinking, well, he's been convicted of these horrible crimes. Why should anybody care about him? Well, we care about him because we care about our system of justice here and we want the right thing to be done. Um, and that's that's really uh, that's why he felt he had to say those words today. He appreciated that his treatment by the guards in the MCC. They always were gentlemen to him, and that's important too because not everybody's always treated him so well. What do you think would be a fair outcome of this, given the charges that he was facing? Look, you know, a fair outcome was a fair trial. That's all we wanted. I I, I never came here, you know, to tell you after a conviction um, that perhaps the uh, decision wasn't the right one. All I said is I wanted a fair trial. And that's, that's what every defendant, I don't care if you're, if you're charged with jaywalking in the Bronx, you deserve a fair trial. Um, it doesn't always happen in America. You, you saw it happen yesterday with the Eric Garner case. Uh, this is a guy that was, was choked in, day, in, in broad daylight by a police officer and killed over loose cigarettes, over nothing, over nothing. And this office decided not to bring charges. So you'll forgive me if I don't have the utmost respect for how they handled uh, this case and their desperate efforts to avoid a hearing. All we want is justice. That's all we want. That's all anybody wants when they come into these hallowed grounds. And that's exactly what we should expect. Jeff, what about the $12 million the government said is $12 billion? What about that? I think it's $12.7 billion. I don't want you to short anybody $700 million. Um, but it's a fiction. It's part of the show trial that we're here for. Um, they, they've, they've been looking for his assets for how long? Decades? They've found right now, before they get to $12.7 billion, how about they get to dollar one? When they get to dollar one, wake me up. Right now, they're at zero. So I don't know that we're really ever going to see anything with that. It's a fiction. We all know that. It's part of the show. It was magnificent calculation. It was wonderful. The number of trees that have been felled to uh, allow the Eastern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office uh, to put in all their thousands of submissions, and that it took me about a month until after the trial the that every fights, night the number of at 11:58 at, at p.m. Every night now for a month after the trial, I'd wake up in a cold sweat because I was waiting for the 60-page submission that would come every single night like clockwork. Uh, my alarm is set for 6 o'clock in the morning, and my internal alarm was set for 11.58 p.m. because every single night we'd get a whopper of a submission from the government that we had to read and digest and respond to before the next uh, jury day. So can he make any you know, if there's no assets, I don't know, maybe he could write an IOU. If there's no assets, there's nothing to pay. The government knows this. It's just, it's procedural. It's a fiction. Um, can we be hearing from Mr. Uh, perhaps. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, look, Emma is, you know, obviously, she's crushed by this. Uh, this has been an incredibly arduous situation, not just as his wife, but as the mother of his two beloved children. Um, you know, his, his kids are innocent here. And uh, this has been an incredibly compelling, uh, compellingly difficult thing for them. They have to see their father in a very small locked room where they don't get to have any physical contact. The kids are not allowed to hug their father. Um, look, and I get, I don't want to suggest for a second that I don't understand uh, some of the government's security measures, but these are, you know, little girls um, that just want to hug their father and they're denied that uh, opportunity and have not hugged him in years. Appeal is being uh, filed. Uh, here's the walking and talking embodiment of the appeal. Uh, Mark Furnish will be handling the appeal. And uh, yeah, I mean, there are significant issues here relating obviously to the motion for a new trial, the extradition issues, the curtailment of cross-examinations that I've never in, in a case in 28 years of practice have I ever been curtailed uh, as much as I was in this case. But I understand, I get it. This was an inquisition, this was a show. We needed to show the world 
that we do things better here in America in terms of the justice system. You saw it yesterday with, with the Garner case, and again, I would say you saw it today uh, with the, the Chapo Guzman case. It's, it's not always better. We're not always exceptional. We're the best in the world, but we're not always exceptional. Um, any other questions? Are you going to handle Epstein and this deal at the same time? I'll figure it out. Confident I can handle both. I mean, look, you know, this is this is what we do. People, as uh, somebody, a reporter said to me yesterday, is do you get to pick and choose uh, the, the cases you have? Why aren't you careful with who you decide to represent? Well, there are a lot of lawyers that told me not to come into this case. There are a lot of lawyers that told me not to come into the Gotti Jr. case. There are a lot of lawyers that have been telling me for years not to come into cases because you need to be more careful and protect your career. You know what? We're here to live on this earth one time. That. I'm here to, to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm here to try cases and I'm here to give people their constitutional rights and I'm sorry if it offends some people, but I'm just here to do my job and I'll do it till my last breath. What we're here to do is represent individuals and make sure they get the most vigorous and zealous defense possible and we're here to make sure that those rights are afforded to them so that every one of us, we're here to make sure that the rights the Constitution guarantees the worst among us, the alleged worst among us, are afforded to each and every one of us, and we're here to defend individual clients, whether it's Jeffrey Epstein or Joaquin Guzman. The same rules of play should apply to anyone who walks into an American courtroom, from the richest to the most notorious to the lowest. That's what we're here to do, and that's why I can represent Jeffrey Epstein or Joaquin Guzman and anyone else who's charged with a serious or even a minor crime. Thank you. The prosecutors criticized Chapo for not expressing remorse. Does he feel remorse? You know, I, I don't know that, that, that today's day for remorse. They, they want him to express remorse because uh, based on their trial, where they said that he was guilty, you know what? Maybe they should express remorse for not giving a hearing in a case in which half the jury cheated and lied to the judge. So with, respectfully, you know, I don't know what they expected today. They, they, would, would remorse have changed the statutory minimum of life in prison? Of course not. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that, why are the rules different for Joaquin Guzman? He wanted justice. That's what he was mourning today, his lack of, of getting justice. Thank you. Thank you. We have major, major issues for the appeal. Some of them were fronted today, obviously. The inhumane conditions of confinement that were imposed in this case and interfered with his and anybody's ability to present a defense. And you know he's presumed innocent. That's one of the things that sets our country apart from any other country. No matter how bad the allegations are, no matter how infamous the defendant is, he came here presumed innocent, just like every one of us standing here today. And as a pretrial detainee who's been convicted of nothing, nothing, he was subjected to conditions that, let's face it, are a functional equivalent to a living death penalty. And that's not justice in the United States of America, and that's in no way the kind of justice that the framers of our Constitution ever contemplated. That will surely come up on the appeal. Mr. Lickman has eloquently explained to you the really troubling way, the really troubling way this new trial motion was handled with very serious and facially credible allegations swept under the rug just to preserve a verdict in the name of expediency. Because as, as Jeff said, the hearing in this case would have been very ugly and God knows what, would have revealed, what it would have revealed. And let's be clear about this. Let's be clear about this. These allegations allegations, these factual reports that this juror made on their face say they're just the tip of an iceberg. So to this day and forever in history, this verdict will be clouded and stained because we don't know the full extent or the truth of what happened here. But we know it's very serious and we know that on pain of criminal sanction, this juror came out and said that the entire jury, well, that's too much, a great number of members of this jury panel lied to the judge's face. And if the head stinks, you got to throw out the fish. And this jury smells based on the allegations. And you've got to think, think seriously about throwing out the body, which is the verdict. And we didn't get a chance to do that. And that's very troubling. And it's not in keeping with the way we do justice in this country. And, and that's right. And, and I'll leave it as this, is that you can bury Joaquin Guzman under uh, tons of steel in Colorado and make him disappear but you're never gonna remove the stink from this verdict due to the failure to order a hearing on the misconduct of the jury in this case.
You know, I hope it's going to be, you know, uh, 60 days we asked for so he can work on the appeal. I don't know that he's going to Supermax, I presume it, um, uh, which is, you know, actually maybe a walk in the park compared to what he's been through right now. Thank you. All right, well, we have been listening to lawyers for drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman speaking outside of the courthouse in Brooklyn after El Chapo was just sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years. The court also ordered Guzman to pay $12.6 billion as a penalty. The 62-year-old was convicted in February of multiple conspiracy counts in a drug trafficking case after a trial that lasted nearly three months. During this sentencing, El Chapo spoke for about 15 minutes. He complained about his living conditions, which he has been in for the past 30 months, saying that he has been tortured and wasn't given a fair trial. El Chapo has been kept in solitary confinement and under close watch while behind bars in New York after he was able to escape from prisons in Mexico.